Hey there, everybody. I'm Chris Charbonneau, the associate publisher of Fish Talk Magazine. And below me is Mr. Lenny Rudo, our angler in chief. Now, it's been a long time since I've been on this program, but uh, we let our buddy Zach go on, uh, uh, well, at least take a day off. Uh, he wanted to go fishing, but I don't know that he's getting out there. But anyway, I'm glad to be back. It's uh, It's been a long time, Lenny. It's good to see you, Chris. And uh, much as I hate Zach's absence, I think it was a great thing for him to get away for three straight days of fishing. But yeah, unfortunately, it, it looks like a the weather's going to be a total bomb the next few days, which of course is going to affect a lot of folks watching this who are hoping to go trolling for rock fish in the next couple of days. It's yeah, going to be yeah. difficult, and yeah. and then on top of that. Zach's dad's boat caught on fire. There's that. Ah, <laughs> how bad can he get? I, I think he's lucky, though, because a neighbor saw the fire, grabbed a fire extinguisher, and put it out. And it was in the same rigging tube that held the fuel line. Ooh, wow. Yeah. So I didn't, get, I didn't get the details on that. That's wow. Yes. That's, uh, that's amazing. It's, it's really lucky the, ball did not, the boat did not become a giant ball of flames. Right. But, be that as it may, today we're here to talk about trophy rockfish. Sweet. Yes, but we do have a couple announcements first, right? We we certainly do. Well, first we got to we got to thank our sponsor, uh, Shimano. Um, without them, we, you and I wouldn't be doing this. That's right. Um, and specifically, the world the minnow. World minnow. So I got to tell you, Chris, I haven't used a world minnow yet. But I looked it up when I found out that we had this slide for tonight's show. And it's kind of cool. This is a 5 8 ounce, four and a half inch jerk bait. It's a suspender, dives four to six feet. And what's different about it is you can kind of see it in this picture. See that glow up yeah. near its head? Yeah, so that it, 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 they call that flash boost. And mm. it, it's kind of like a, it looks like a strip of foil inside that wiggles as the lure wiggles. And so it gives you more reflective nature to this lure uh, and uh, it's also got the holographic scales so it looks really cool i kind of can't wait to try one out myself that's it is kind of neat looking it's like uh the terminator of lures <laughs> yeah it's yeah. got that little extra something special i saw yeah. somewhere somewhere i saw that they had said um uh the the technology to make every other jerk bait obsolete <laughs> now I don't know if that's going to happen, but <laughs> I, I am psyched to try this one out. It looks pretty cool. It's good to and, have goals. And doesn't Shimano have a surprise for everybody? We do. We have a giveaway today. Dun, dun, dun. Very nice. This beautiful Shimano hat. Uh, sponsored in part by, or in partnership, I should say, with uh, uh, the Coastal Conservation Association. And this hat is not... It's it's not uh, or it comes with sweat activated cooling technology. Cools up to five degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and I'm gonna up the ante, Chris. I am, All right. I'm gonna say our lucky winner tonight will not only get the Shimano hat, they will get a pair of Fish Talk magazine koozies and what a yeah, and a Jackal Tackle Super Eruptor Spinner Bay. Nice. The so, Jackal Tackle. Stick all kinds it. of cool stuff coming. And how can somebody win these goodies, Chris? So, they're just going to have to pay attention. That's right. Uh, we're, you will instantly be able to win this hat and the other uh, prizes. Um, but you have to stay tuned and you have to pay attention. That's right. You'll get an opportunity midstream mid to make a comment that could make you an instant winner tonight. Yes. And if we don't get a winner from that, you know, we'll do like we always do. We'll throw the names in the hat. And we'll draw one. Yep. Uh, depending on who, you know, to get your name in the hat, simply ask a question, uh, hopefully an intelligent question. And uh, we always encourage people to ask questions during live with Lenny. Just pop them into the comments. And uh, Chris will uh, jump in where appropriate and uh, bring us those questions. Yep. I'm, I'm pretty confident we'll get somebody with the right answer, though. I hope so. I think so. I think so. Yeah. All right. Should we get started, Chris? Let's go. 
So it is Trophy Rockfish season, people. Uh, we're five days in. The results thus far, uh, I'm going to call somewhat lackluster. Uh, haven't heard of a lot of big catches. Biggest I've heard of is six fish. You know, 10 years ago, we would have been going, eh, you know, a dozen, two dozen these days. It's more like, you know, five or six is a banner day. Um, and I haven't been hearing of, of a whole lot of fish. Some guys are getting them. You're getting onesies, twosies. Um, the best zone that I've been hearing about has been the middle bay section. It has been from Thomas Point, Bloody Point, down to the Solomons area. Haven't been hearing a whole lot south of that. Been heard a little bit. Haven't been hearing much of anything north of that. I think I've heard of one fish north of the bridge. Now, we'll get into much more uh, detail on the specifics coming out in the reports tomorrow morning, of course. Uh, if you haven't signed up for the reports, go to fishtalkmag.com, click on the reports. You can pop in your email there, and then we'll send you a notification as the reports come out. They always come out by noon on Friday. Now, <clears throat> I chose this slide here to put up because... Uh, according to all the reports, no surprise here, people, no shocker. Uh, the big producers have been umbrellas and tandem rigs. The big producing colors have been chartreuse and white. Like I said, not a big surprise. That's kind of the norm for this time of year. Um, it, it is the norm for this time of year. And uh, if you want to go out and troll for these trophy fish, umbrellas and tandems and chartreuse and white will be the top producers. Rare occasions, really cloudy days, really low light. Uh, you'll get some darker color action, some purple, some browns, blacks, that kind of stuff may produce. But as a general rule of thumb, it's going to be this gear is kind of what it is for the trophies. One exception, you know, jerk baits uh, like, like that Shimano one that we saw earlier, uh, the kayak guys have a fair amount of success trolling those on shoals and in shallows that are adjacent to deep water. So when you have an area where you got, you know, three, four feet of water with maybe some rocks, some kind of structure that drops off nearby, uh, you kayak guys, trolling jerk baits like that is a great option that will produce some fish. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, Chris, go ahead and take us to the next slide if you would, please. And now we're going to take a look at a picture that I love. I love seeing these smiling faces, these big fish. Uh, this was taken a, a couple few years ago on the ebb tide. And the reason I wanted to pop this slide up is because if you look up, you'll see one, two, three, four rods stacked on the hard top. You'll see three going down the sides. That is a partial glimpse of the rods on this boat. Uh, there are actually five on either side of the hard top, the three down the sides, and then uh, six more going around the back of this boat. Um, Trolling for Trophy Rock is often a numbers game. Uh, you know, we used to call it collision fishing. You go out there and put as many lures in the water as you possibly can and hope a fish collides with one. Uh, that's just kind of how this game is played. So now I, I don't recommend that the average recreational angler attempt to put out this type of spread. Chris, let's go ahead and pop up the next slide. We're going to see what a charter spread might look like. This is a 22 line spread here, people. You got all the ones across the hard top. Those are all going to your planer boards. You got rods going down the sides. Those are also going to your planer boards, except the ones in the very corner. Then you got the ones along the transom. Now, I just said a minute ago, I don't recommend the average recreational guy go out and try this. Why? Well, because you're gonna have a ton of tangles. It's gonna be a ginormous mess. You really got to have a big platform and know what you're doing to run this many lines. But I still wanted to pop up the slide because we see a couple crucial pieces of information here. At the top, lines one to 10, mix of tandem rigs with no additional weight. Those are all going to the planer boards, right? And then, this is important, lines set longest go farthest from the boat. So that first planer board line, you're sending it all the way out to the end. That should be your longest behind the planer board. Your next one a little shorter, next one a little shorter, next one a little shorter. Why? Well, the idea is to minimize the tangles. And if all those planer board lines are set at exactly the same distance and a fish grabs one, it's much more likely to swim into a different line. If you stagger those lengths, will you still get tangles? Heck yeah, you will. <laughs> it's part of the game when you're pulling a whole big bunch of lines. But staggering them like that will help minimize the number of tangles. Now, Chris has helpfully popped up a link at the bottom of the screen. 
This is an article that is currently on our website. You can go and check it out. You'll see this diagram. You'll see others that go into smaller spreads, more applicable for recreational boats. Um, and, and they really will go into detail, much more detail than we can get into right now uh, that describes everything. The other thing you can do if you don't want to try and figure out this whole link thing here is you can simply go to fishtalkmag.com. In the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you'll see a search box, plug in trophy stripers or trolling for trophies, something like that. And those articles will pop up. We have a number of them. Um, all right, Chris, why don't you go ahead and take us to the next slide here. <clears throat> I'm going to get a quick gulp of beverage. Oh. All right. I, I was going to say before we go on, how about we uh, grab some questions here. Um, Bring them on. Joe wanted to talk about the Potomac. Uh, well, you know what, Joe? The truth of the matter is I haven't been hearing a heck of a lot from the Potomac. I, I, couple, you know, a couple good reports, um, several skunk reports. Um, now, of course, you can only fish. I think it's from the 301 bridge down. Don't take my word from that for that. Check the regs if you're going to go out there. Uh, but there is, you know, it is limited territory. We have been hearing from guys who are shad fishing that they're having their rigs ripped off by big fish, which tells me that the bulk of the spawners, at least up until now, have still been way up river. And uh I'm not terribly surprised because everything has seemed to be a little bit more delayed this year than normal. We had kind of a cool spring. The water hasn't warmed up as much as it might have. And uh, not only are we still hearing about fish upping in the, up in the spawning zones, um, I'm also seeing a lot of the pictures of fish that I'm seeing come in look fat. They look really fat. They look like they may well be pre-spawn. Uh, Chris, do we have any other questions to hit on at the moment? Uh, yeah, let's let's just um, hit on bay fish. Okay, so the question is, do you think we should have a limit on the number of rods? So, um, man, that's a tough question. My personal opinion is, yeah, we probably should. It's kind of out of hand how many rods are up there. Now, I know some of the charter guys right now are going, oh, Lenny, don't say that. Dang it, we need to catch our fish. And, and you know, I understand their perspective. They've got a point. Um, but you know, when we're running 24, 26, 28 lines to catch fewer fish than we used to, you know, it might be a sign that maybe things are just a little bit out of hand. I'd like to note just for the record that in freshwater, you're only allowed to be fishing two, I think it's two rods at a time. It might be three, but I think it's two. Um, so we already have regulations like that on the books, but when it comes to trolling for these fish, we do not have a limit on the number. So should we have a limit on the number of rods? You know, maybe we should have a conversation about that. Maybe that's something that it's time to talk about. All right. All right. Let's move on. All right. Take it on. Okay. So this is one of the most important slides in the bunch, folks. If you're going to go out there and you're going to pull planer boards, for goodness sakes, get the orange flag. It only costs a couple extra bucks. and Everybody needs to have the orange flag flying off the planer board, okay? Or it can be yellow or green or whatever. Uh, but the bottom line is, if you don't, what will happen sooner or later is uh, someone's going to run over your planer board. And until that happens, you're going to have tons of people who are driving and driving and driving. They're trolling along, and they see your boat, and they're keeping a certain distance. And then at some point, they go, oh, my God, he's got planer boards. and have flags on him. I didn't see him. And they're going to have to make a hard turn. So, A, you are aggravating just about everybody else out there if you don't have flags on your planer boards. And B, you're endangering your own rig. Sooner or later, somebody's going to run over it. They're going to run over the line. They're going to troll a line across it. They're just not going to see it. It's not their fault. Uh, and then, you know, next thing you know, everyone's yelling at each other and you got big tangles and a big mess. Oh, it's all avoidable, people. Put the flag on the planer boards. Please. All right. All right. Enough um, about that, Chris. Let's move on. All right. Okay. So, Boom. attention, anglers. Here is your chance to win tonight's prize package. If before I divulge what the problem is here, you look at this picture and you can tell me the problem. Now, we're going to assume 
that these are conscientious anglers. They realize the fishery is in trouble. They're out there having fun. They plan to release this fish. Now, just for the record, this fish was caught several years ago. It was not released, so nobody was worried about it. But there's one thing you can see in this picture that is a big no-no if you plan on getting a quick picture and then releasing the fish. I'll state just for the record, the anglers have wet their hands, so we're not removing slime from the fish. The fish was netted with a net that had rubber mesh, not knotted nylon netting, so it didn't hurt the fish. Chris, you popped right up. Did someone already see what's wrong? Way ahead of you. I mean, uh, now it's all pouring in, but ah, Daryl's the good. All right, we got a winner. Daryl, you are the winner. Uh, be sure, it looks like you're on Facebook, so be sure to PM us so we can get in touch with you and get your address and send you all these goodies. You get the koozies, you get the you get the jackal tackle. Thank you for pointing out the guy's hand is right in the fish's gill plate. Now, I don't know about you, and this, this has never happened to me, but I have the feeling if someone stuck their hand down my throat and twiddled their fingers or out of my lungs, I would not be happy, right? Is that a fair assumption, Chris? Yeah, I hate it when the people do that. Yeah, you know, that can't possibly be a healthy maneuver. His fingers are inside the gill plate. Now, again, in this case, the fish was kept. We weren't, we weren't worried about it when taking this. And I took this picture. We weren't worried about it at the time. Uh, this was several years ago. The fish was going in the box. Not a big deal. But if you're going to release the fish for gosh sakes, people, don't stick your hand in the gill plate because you're, you're going to touch the fish's gills and that's its lungs. So, Daryl, congratulations. Good job, man. Yeah. Uh, All right. Real quick, we got a we got a good question from Andrew. Um, oh, actually, that's not the one. I <laughs> I'm sorry. Daryl asked a question before he piped in about about the picture. If there are older shad that have lost their green color but are still green in condition, are they effective? Oh, so you're talking about the plastic sheds. I know what you mean. How they fade. Yeah. So I'm going to say, you know, still run them. I mean, you don't have to throw them away. Look. The two, the two colors we mentioned, standbys, chartreuse and white. What happens when it fades? Eh, they get kind of yellowish. They get more white and less lime green. So personally, I don't think it's a problem. Now that said, you may want to always keep a few new ones in the mix. So you've always got the bright chartreuses mixed in there as well as the other colors. But I don't think you need to throw them away. I think it's okay to keep using them. Uh, and... I'll put Andrew's question up there. Just any tips you might have for him on the Susquehanna. Later in May, Susquehanna Flats. Yeah, so I got a tip for you. Um, this popped up an awful lot last year. Uh, when the season opened up there, a lot of the early birds who had good success were using white perch. Yep, they were live baiting white perch. They did very, very well with them. Now, when I was much younger, we did some live baiting with white perch. We used to take a pair of shears and snip off the dorsal fin. And we felt that that made it more attractive to the rockfish. Um, I've talked to several of the guys who have been live lining up there. They don't do that. And I've come to believe it's not necessary. And if you think about it, in nature, the fish still has its dorsal spines and the big fish still eat the little fish. So I'm thinking it's probably just fine to do it. Um, that was very effective last year. A lot of... I, I can't put a number on it, but many, many, many of the successful reports we saw from the flats were guys who were live lining white perch. Now, don't forget, you got to have your circle hooks, right? Which means you're going to let the, the, the fish eat it for maybe, you know, three, four, five seconds and then slowly apply tension. That's the trick is to not, it's not just you don't want to set the hook, it's that you don't want to quickly apply tension. You want a slow application of tension. So remember that. Also, I'm going to throw in there, people. You know, the circle hooks have not turned out to be the panacea that we all thought they were. Uh, I say that having had caught several bleeding fish on circle hooks in the last couple of years until I basically swore off live lining completely last year because it just it was happening. Now, I do think that a big part of the problem here is people are using circle hooks that are too small. I've been told by some of the old timers when they fished them way back when. They only had like eight dots. That was the smallest circle hook you could find in the stores. And those, it seems, didn't gut hook the fish quite as often. So if you're going to 
fish any kind of bait for the rockfish, I would suggest going to an ADOT or larger circle hook. Um, and, and you know what? If you're hooking fish in the gut, you just stop doing it. You know? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share this one from Bayfish just telling us. He's talking about the bay side. <clears throat> just uh, Yellow. Okay. Yeah. There you very, go. Very similar. That's, you know, those are your, your standard issue colors. You don't have to go far afield. You really don't. And you see some crazy colors out there. <laughs> you know, you don't have to go far afield. Um, now, before we go to the next slide, Chris, I yeah. just want to mention one other thing. You got it queued up. Are you ready? But don't do it yet. Okay. Uh, I've, I've got the next slide ready, Lenny. Okay, let's just remind everybody, we're pretending here the fish is going to be released. Yep. The guy's got his hand in the gills, no good for release. But we are seeing a horizontal fish being supported, which is good. We know that the hands were wetted first so they don't remove the slime. We know the net was proper, rubber mesh, right? Not knotted nylon, which roughs up the fish and removes slime. All right, Chris, go ahead and take us to the next one. Oh, look, hey. people. There he is, Sharp the Barb himself. That's Chris. That is one heck of a nice fish. That was a beautiful fish. That was also a few years ago. That this was. fish, and this fish was destined to release, right? Yeah. We, we let this guy go. And uh, you see here the fish is horizontal. Here, same guy made on the ebb tide. He's holding the fish properly in the lip. He knows this fish is going to be released. He's supporting. The aft end of the fish just behind the belly. That's good. And actually, if you look at this fish right behind the uh, second dorsal, you can see that little strip of yellow there. That's actually a tag. We, we tagged this fish before we let him go. Mm -hmm. um, as I recall, you guys held that pose for what? All of about four seconds? Yeah. We snapped off a couple pictures, and then back in the water it went. Now, Everybody needs to realize, you know, we, we can have all kinds of discussions about the state of the fishery and what should be done and what shouldn't be done. We could go on for ages about that. But the bottom line fact of the matter is anybody who's been fishing for 10 years or more has seen a very clear decline in the numbers of fish. Um, you know, it, it's been pretty dramatic. Um, what do we need to do about it? I'm not here to state that. Uh, I do hope that everybody will consider potentially releasing trophy size fish that they catch this year. Um, maybe, you know, limit yourself to one trophy a year if you like to take them home and eat them. Just for the record, you know, the smaller fish are coming into season in just a couple weeks. And truth be told, the 24 inch fish tastes a heck of a lot better than the 42 inch fish. It really does. And anybody who eats them can tell you that. You, you, you people know that already. So, you know, maybe we let the fish go early in the season and we wait, you know, just a little bit before we keep any. Um, and if not, you know what? I would never knock anybody for keeping a legal fish as long as you're operating within the bounds of the law. As far as I'm concerned, you're good. Um, but like I said, we're seeing a lot more of these pre-spawn fish. These are these fish that's, you know, it's a little odd because the season's been backed up by two weeks, but we're still seeing some pre-spawn fish. So, um I would just ask everybody to think about what they want to do and, and, you know, what the right move for them is. All right, Chris, go ahead and take us to the next slide, if you would, please. So here we have a trophy that this is this is me, as you can tell by the, uh, the little bit of dark coloration right there. <laughs> this is a few years ago. It's a lot of years ago. And uh, <clears throat> that's actually it's not the biggest fish rockfish I've ever caught in the bay. But it is one of the longest. That was actually a 46 and a half inch fish, believe it or not. Uh, and you can see it's super, super, super skinny. So, you know, my hope would be that's a male. Certainly it was not pre-spawn if it was a female. It'd be awful big for a male. But, you know, crazy things happen in nature. Um, but I wanted to pop it in here because I got the rod laying down next to me. You can see it's light tackle. Um, you can catch these fish on light tackle if you so choose. Now. How you're going to do it? I, I got a couple pieces of bad news for you. The first one is it's nowhere nearly as easy as catching fish that are holding on structure with light tackle. Uh, jigging for them is very difficult. And there's one spot that holds them at this time of year. Here's your, here's your bad news, people. It's the power plant. We all know what that can be like when the rockfish are in season. 
Uh, I talked to a friend who said that there were 13 boats there on Monday. Um, I don't want to hazard a guess as to how many were there on Saturday, but I talked to several people who were fishing there. They said it was crowded. There were some big fish caught. Um, not everybody got them, not by a long shot. You know, maybe one boat in five got a big fish. Um, a lot of smaller fish were also caught. But if you want to jig up, a trophy size rockfish at this time of year, that's probably honestly your best shot. Uh, I have personally also had some success on them. Uh, the, the stretch off the uh, west side of Poplar Island, right at the channel edge there, you have a really sheer drop off. Sometimes you'll be able to find a pot of fish meandering around there. Um, that It's not just one you know, single lone fish migrating out. They, they tend to I guess congregate there a little bit. It's a good area to try. You can look for gannets. You can try and fish under gannets. Um, but it's kind of a tall order. Now, here's your other piece of bad news. The other best way to do it is to do like the kayak guys do and to go to those shallow areas uh, <laughs> pre dawn and right at dusk. So, I, you know what? When I was young, I had no problem getting up at four in the morning and being out there pre dawn. These days is a different story. I really don't want to get up at four o'clock to be out on the water at five o'clock. Um, but if you want to catch a trophy on light tackle, you know what? You'll really radically up your chances if you, you know, go the extra mile and do it and be out there at daybreak in one of those likely areas where you have a ridge, you have some structure, something that's going to interrupt the current that's going down the bay. Because remember, you got to be on the main stem bay right now. Um, somewhere like that, uh, where you have, you know, just a couple few feet of water, right? You'll catch these fish in four or five feet of water at the right times. Uh, if you get a really cloudy, rainy day, that window of opportunity can be extended. You know, it can go on after the sun has risen above the horizon because that's your best time is when the sun is below the horizon, but it's still light. And that goes for both sunrise and sunset. Once that sun is up in the sky, uh, it, you know, it gets different. Uh, how shallow am I talking? Like I said, you know, four, five, six feet is plenty of water for these fish. Uh, two feet is not too shallow at certain times in certain places. It's, you know, certainly on the shallow side. Um, you know, big fish get caught every year at Thomas Point within casting distance of the rocks. And that's just a couple feet of water. That normally is a topwater thing. That's that's often um, plugs being thrown topwater, uh, but you can certainly also get them with jigs, with jerk baits, whatever. Uh, and just for the record, you know, if you want to target these specific fish in mid-November, there is historically often a run of some really nice sized fish, 35, 30, 35 inch plus fish. Uh, right there off the rocks. So, you know, they, it can be real super shallow. Don't be afraid of going shallow. All right, why don't you go ahead and pop us to the next slide, Chris. Here we have a fish that was caught on light tackle again in a, a method that I used to apply quite a bit. Haven't done it so much in the last few years simply because I'm trying to lay off of these fish personally. Uh, but chumming for them, or I should say chunking and chumming, can be highly effective. Now, in the olden days, back in the good old days, you know, 15 years ago, when we kept, used to catch a lot of these fish, you know, I would go out and hope for a, yeah, let's say a four to 12 fish day. That would be a good day. You know, 12 would be great. But, you know, four, five, eight fish would be a great day. Uh, you could do that, chummy. The last couple of years, honestly, if you catch one, it's an awesome day. You might get two. Uh, you'll go home with a skunk regularly. That That will happen. Um, chumming is not as effective as trolling for them. You've only got four or five lines in the water. That's it. It's all you really want to put out there. Um, but you know, again, light tackle, you can do it with, you know, a 17 pound spinning rig like this right here. Uh, this was on my dad's boat. That's actually my niece. And as you can see, that was a much chunkier fish. The photo got cut off. That was actually like a, I don't know. 44, 46 inch fish that was really big and plump. Um, you can see the weight swinging just above her head. What you want to do is you want to put your chum all the way down on the bottom, lift it up a foot, cleat the line. So as the boat rocks, the chum shakes out. 
uh, you want to put your baits dead on the bottom. I honestly don't know why, but for whatever reason, uh, mid depth and surface lines with this style of fishing, they just, they don't ever seem to take the bait. I don't know why, but they never do. Um, and on the rare occasions they do, they're small fish. Um, the big ones, they seem to drop down to the bottom in a certain segment of the tide and just scavenge down there for a little bit before they move on. That certain segment is one hour before the change into the half hour of after the change itself. Now, remember, the currents and the tides will be a little different depending on where you are, right? So what you want to do is if, you know, if you can, uh, if you know how far, how long the delay is, great. You kind of know how to plan. This was at Love Point. It's like an hour 15 to an hour and a half off. So if the low tide is at noon uh, on the tide charts, I'm going to be setting up at like, you know, 11. I'll have lines in the water 1130. And I'll expect that at one is when I'll actually see that change in the current. And that's what's going to trigger the fish anywhere from in that time frame till about a half an hour after the tide changes is when you're usually going to catch your fish. I say usually I kept records on this for many, many years, decades. And uh, the breakdown, I might get the numbers a little bit wrong. The breakdown is in my uh, rockfish guide and in Rudo's Guide to Fishing the Chesapeake. And it's like 80% in that last hour, 10% in the next half hour. And then only the, the remaining 10% that are outside of that spectrum. Um, so it really is, you know, once the tide's running and kind of in its long, hours long uh, pattern, it, it's pretty darn rare to pick one up like this. It'll, it'll happen, but it doesn't happen much. Whew. All right. I got to take a, a sip here of my beverage. Chris, do we have any more questions at this point? Gosh, Lenny, you, you've uh, answered everybody's questions. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, don't feel afraid to chime in and ask them. Yep. Um, we're going to go on now to what I'm going to say is the most important slide in tonight's show. Go ahead and bring it up, Chris. Past, present, and future of strike bass, a Chesapeake perspective. Uh, this is something that Fish Talk um, is doing, uh, is helping with. I will be moderating these discussions. It's the driving force behind it is CCA, Coastal Conservation uh, Association of Maryland. And that little link that just popped up, that is where you can go to sign up for it. Now, you can also go to fishtalkmag.com, our website, and plug into the search box, Chesapeake Perspective. Uh, what you'll uh, go to, the, the very first hit, is my last notes from the notes from the cockpit column, which talks about this these these events, these upcoming events, and has a link that takes you right to this Woo Box thing. What is Woo Box, Chris? I don't understand why that's the link. What is that? <laughs> that's, a, that's a service we use to oh. uh, put these things all together. Interesting. Okay. Well, anyway, when you click on it, basically they just it's a it's a place you can put in your name and your email, and then you will get an email alerting you as these events go off. Um, it's a pre-register. That's all there is to it. We'd like as many folks as possible to do it. Uh, more importantly, we want everybody to tune in. Um, these will not be incredibly different from Live with Lenny's, uh, but they will be because we'll have real experts to help us learn about straight bass and the fishery. Yeah. Um, just as a, for example, we're going to talk about the striper moratoriums and what we learned from it in the first one, which is May 12th. That's next Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, I'm going to have to reach for my glasses for this, folks, because I couldn't memorize this. You have to read it up. So we're going to have fisheries biologists with us, including Jim Uphoff from the DNR, Bill, Bill Goldsboro, uh, retired now from CBF, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and Marty Gary, who also used to be with the DNR and now is with the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Um, we're going to have the people with us who know what's been going on. And um, these will be interactive. You'll be able to ask questions uh, during these. Um, but the, the real key here to these presentations is uh, we, we want the recreational fishing community, all you folks out there, to become better educated about the fishery, where it's been, where it is, and where it's going. And here's why. 
if there's any one thing I've learned about fisheries management and public comment in the last couple of years, it is that having educated commentary is critical. Not all the powers that be pay attention to our public comment, but some absolutely do. And the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission meeting yesterday, which I, I watched, was a great example of it. Um, there was overwhelming public comment in favor of certain uh, options in how we manage the fishery. And the votes pretty much mirrored them. Um, in fact, several of the votes where there was tremendous, overwhelming public comment on, um, they were unanimous or near unanimous. There, I think there were a total of 16 votes in these in the committee, and it was like 15 and one abstention, 16 and none. You know, it was, it was really a, a pretty tremendous showing. Now, again, the comment has to be educated. And these fishery managers, folks, these people are living neck deep in the fisheries. They're living neck deep in the, Ch the Chesapeake, the rockfish. What's going on with them? And believe me, if you're shooting from the hip when you're making comments, they know it. If you know what you're talking about, they absolutely know it. And they, whether it's intentional or subconscious, they place more weight when you're comment when you know what's going on. So we as a recreational angling community, we need to know what's going on. We need to be educated about it. We need to understand the different options and where they may take us. And you may notice the third in this series is called Rebuilding a Fishery and a Bay that Future Anglers Deserve. That's what we'll culminate with. And man, we need the recreational anglers to chime in. We need our community to really voice its preferences. Um, you know, we used to have the MSSA. That's dead and gone, right? It's dead and gone. Thank you, Dave Smith. Dead and gone. Sorry, but it's a reality. Um, today, the only seat at the table speaking for the recreational fishermen is CCA. That's it. So, you know, everybody who reads Fish Talk has seen me write it a thousand times over. If you care about this fishery, if you care about fishing in general, you got to join CCA. You should be a member. For gosh sakes, join one of the tournaments. When you pay the entry fee, you become a member. Um, this is something that needs to happen. We, we, you know what? Can I just bottom line something here, Chris? Go ahead. Can I bottom line something? We recreational anglers on the bay, we're getting screwed. We're getting screwed left and right. We're losing our access. Uh, if you hadn't noticed, we're down to one fish a day at 19 inches and we have a two week closure and other parts of the fishery get to keep two a day. You know, how bad is it going to get before recreational anglers will get their due? I don't know, but I hope no worse. You know, look at sea bass. We, you know, we just got screwed on sea bass. Yep. Uh, the stock assessment went up. They say there are more sea bass than ever. And our catch limits went, which way do you think? Down. Down. Correct. Um, uh, we, we got some questions lined up, Lenny, if you want to. Uh... I'll, get off my, I'll get off my soapbox. I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is really important, people. Please, please tune in for the Chesapeake perspective. Please become educated about this. And please, for God's sakes, even when it seems futile, keep giving that public comment. All right. I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead. No, here we go. I think it's worth it. It's worth everyone's time. We're about down there. Someone's really trolling. So, uh, Kevin, most of the reports of success that I've heard have been slightly north of Salmon, uh, the gas docks area, kind of off the gas docks. Um, I did not look at the direction of the wind in the near future, but there's a lot of wind coming. I'm not sure it's even going to be fishable this weekend, but if it is, I'd stay on the side of the bay that's leeward, whichever that may be. But yeah, off the gas docks uh, has been a good area. Heard about a few off Chesapeake Beach, not a lot. A few off the chop tank. Um, those are kind of the zones that we're hearing from. Okay. 
Next, our, our lucky winner, Daryl's back in with another question. When do you switch over to six spades? Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but I think you're probably speaking to, as a troller, when do you take down the big giant mega spread and just switch it out to your kind of normal person spread? Um, and truth be told, you know, <laughs> because the fishery has been dwindling, uh, the pros, they're often keeping up big spreads. They're not going down to six. They're not going down to six. They might only be trolling a dozen lines instead of 28, uh, but they're, they're not going down to six. Now, as a recreational guy, um, as soon as that size limit drops, you can kind of tone things down. You can drop down the size of the baits a little bit. You might want to put out a couple of big ones just to see if you can still score a big fish. But, you know, you, you can drop the size, the, uh, the size of your shad down, drop the size of your spread down and tone everything down. Once that size limit drops, which is, it's only like 10 days away. It's May, um, uh, 15, 15, I think is right. Um, so, you know, at that point, the small fish count and you don't have to worry so much about trying to find that needle in the haystack. All right. So is that the is that the end of trophy season? Is the yeah, that is the official end of trophy season. You know, this year, last year too, we're we're talking about a two week season. Now that's not to say that you won't catch trophy sized fish after that. You will. Um, you can catch them. You know, the longer the season goes, the lower your chances, or the later. I'm sorry, the later it gets, the lower your chances of finding where those big fish go because they're migrating back out of the bay, hitting the ocean, heading north. Right. Yeah. They're, turning left and going up the coast. Uh, but it can still happen. I mean, I've had it happen. I've had it happen as late as June, not far into June and not often, but I have had it happen very end of May, first couple of days of June, something like that. Um, actually last year, we got a couple of fish that were darn close to trophies if they weren't. Uh, when the um, small fish came in, uh, we were throwing jigs over, it was towards Eastern shore. I want to say mouth of Eastern Bay. And we got, you know, several 30 somethings that we didn't measure. They may have made the 35 mark. They may not have, I don't know. They were right in that zone. Uh, but we didn't measure them because you know what? We put them right back over the side. Those were not the fish we were looking for. And we did keep fish. You know, we kept the 24s. We put them in the box. Those 30 plus inch fish these days, um, you know, Again, everyone's personal decision. I'm not going to bang on anyone for keeping illegal fish. But on my boat, if it's over 30 inches, eh, you know, might as well put it back over the side. Uh, came to ask about the schoolies, two water for top water. Any chance to get them casting shallow in the main bay before the rivers open up? Yeah, there is. Uh, again, you're going to want to fish super duper early or super duper late. That's when they're going to be shallow and top water will be a possibility. It won't be prime. Top water generally will not be prime until that water temperature comes up a little more, you know, upper 60s. It gets better and better. Um, but is it doable? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd be going to those same kinds of areas, the, the shallow structure, two to six, eight feet of water. Again, with access, close access to deep water, because those big fish, when they move up shallow, they're often going to do it, you know, just for that early morning feeding period, and then they're going to head back to deep water. So you really, you know, when you're fishing those zones, you really want to be early, late, or, or you know, like I mentioned earlier, the, the bite can be extended on really heavy cloud cover. When you have a really dim day, a really low light day, those fish will move shallow for longer periods. Uh, I'll throw in there um, for fishing the shallows for schoolie sized fish. Last year, we were catching them uh, at Thomas Point Shoal remarkably early in the season in just, you know, three, four feet of water. Now, I wasn't throwing top water. I was throwing jigs. Um, my son, David, threw a jerkbait, not unlike the uh, Shimano we were looking at earlier. Um, and he had success on that. If you're going to do that before it is legal to keep the schooly fish, which is the next 10 days or so, right? Uh, I would strongly recommend removing the trebles and swapping them out for single hooks. The treble hooks do damage fish a lot more than the singles. Um, 
you know, and sometimes they swing around and catch a fish in the eye or something like that. Uh, and you will catch the fish with single hooks. You absolutely will catch them. Might you miss a hit now and again? Well, sure. But that happens with any kind of plug, right? So, you know, again, the jerk baits are kind of a good bet this time of year. Um, but let's swap out those hooks for singles. We, we, we don't need to stick a treble into every fish we see. What's your view on the impact of dolphins in the mid bay? Well, Tom, I'm going to start this one off by saying, as I often do, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> so, you know, I can't, I can't uh, speak from the scientific perspective. Um, I can tell you I've heard from a lot of people, a lot of people, that they're finding a half a rockfish <laughs> and, you know, big rockfish and not, not, not trophy big, but, you know, say a 26 incher. Uh, and the dolphins are really the only things around that are big enough to do that. So are they killing some fish? Absolutely. Have people reported to me that they've watched the dolphin going after the skyrocketing rockfish? Yes, absolutely. People have reported that to me. Now, all that said, let's back up a minute. And let's remember. We're seeing, you know, pods of, you know, what in nature amounts to a handful of fish. 20 dolphin, 40 dolphin. In the mid-tupper bay, you know, they're, they're not they're not big giant schools of hundreds of fish. Um, so I think their impact, whatever it may be, is probably limited just by a matter of sheer numbers. It's not tons of them. And I'll also say, when I was a kid, you know, everybody, the last few years, a lot of people have gone kind of crazy over, oh my God, dolphin in the bay, isn't that crazy? Um, when I was a kid, we saw a dolphin in the bay. It, it was not all that unusual. In fact, I, I venture to say, you know, again, I'm, I'm going back 40 years here, but if you made the run from where we were coming from, which was Bodkin, if you made the run to the chop tank, you would often, if not usually, see dolphin at some point, often down there in the chop tank. You'd see sea turtles too, which, you know, I haven't seen a sea turtle in the bay in a long time, and I don't know why. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> But um, you saw those creatures back then. Now, when we had the tremendous rock fishery 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and we also had great numbers of weak fish, we had better numbers of bluefish, we had croaker, big croaker. Um, I, I don't recall seeing a whole lot of dolphin during that time frame. They did seem to kind of, you know, shy away for a certain period of time from coming up into the mid and upper bay. But it happened before. It's happening now, and it'll happen again. So what that impact is, I, you know, I can't say for sure, but I, I don't believe it can be, like, so huge that it's affecting the health of the rockfish fishery overall. Maybe try and say it like that. I'm going to tag one to that. I know I'm droning on here, Chris. I'm sorry if we got more piled up, but I, I – I'm going to tag on to that. I've seen a whole lot more whole rockfish and catfish and bunker and carp that have been floating dead in the summer months, including during the rockfish closure, going down the bay. You know what I'm talking about, the floaters. We see this, you know, last five years with way too much regularity where we've got these tide lines of just lined up dead fish floating down the bay. Um, that's not dolphins because these fish aren't damaged, visually damaged. At least many, most are not visually damaged. So what's going on? Not being a scientist, being a layman, <clears throat> I would have to point my finger to the water quality and say, you know, during Past years, when we've had less rain flushing into the bay, less garbage flushing into the bay, fewer of these red tides that we're now seeing God, just about everywhere, just about constantly, we didn't see so many fish just floating around dead. So I can't tell you that it's water quality. I can't tell you that it's not the dolphins. But my perspective is that there's probably a really good chance that our biggest problem in the middle and upper bay is water quality, aside from any other single 
issue. And if a scientist wants to chime in and tell me that I'm wrong, I'll be happy to listen to them uh, respectfully and, and I'll hear what they have to say. Uh, but most of the folks that I've talked to, and I do talk to some of these folks, most of them agree that there is a water quality problem that is at the very least contributing to our woes with the fisheries in the Bay right now. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on best, to David. Oh, uh, best line to use for your plane of board to play Scotty clips on. <clears throat> that is a granular question that not having trolled a heck of a lot in the last few years, because like I said, I'm 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 leaving these ones alone. Um I'm not a hundred percent sure how to answer. I believe it's a three or four hundred pound test. And I know a lot of the guys use weed whacker line. They get a spool of the weed whacker line and that's what they use. I think a lot of them prefer that because it's like pinkish reddish and you can see it real easily as well as, you know, being just being good all around for the use. But David, I got to say, don't take my word for it. If, uh, I, if you search it out on Fish Talk Mag, I think we do talk about that in one of the articles, which, you know, we interviewed several different trolling ca <clears throat> charter captains for those articles. But uh, it's going to be something like that, but I wouldn't just take my word for it. I'd look it up. All right. What type of fishing line pound test is most effective for stripers? Well, that depends. That's too open-ended a question because I want to know if you're jigging, if you're trolling, if you're trolling off planer boards, are you trolling all boat lines? Uh, I want to know if you're throwing jigs. I want to know if you're jigging jigging spoons. I want to know if you're fishing bait. I mean, there's just a million different variables that go into that. Um, as far as pound test goes, as a general rule of thumb, you know, uh, during trophy season, <clears throat> most of the guys are using like 40 pound tests. The rest of the year, you know, like 17 pound, 20 pound braid is more than enough for most of the fish that you're going to encounter. And if you got your drag set right, frankly, you can catch just about anything in the bay doing that. I mean, I've hooked into big black drum, 40 pound black drum on my little jigging gear on the wall behind me there, which is 17 pound, dip, pound braid tipped or 15 pound braid tipped with a uh, 20 pound fluoro leader. And, uh, you know, if you got your drag set right and you, and you play your cards right and there are no frays in your land or anything, that'll do the trick. So. And, and Lenny, uh, we're getting a lot of questions, just additional tips for light tackle. Um, and I was just going to put up this link um, that we've got just to go to fishtalkmag.com. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Good. Fast action. Thank fast you. action from Sharp the Bar. <laughs> nice job. And again, you know, it, it, if it's easier, just go to the website, go to the search box, just plug in, you know, Trophy Striper Light Tackle. The stuff will pop right up. We actually have a really good search feature on our website. I'm not sure why. The credit probably goes to Zach because for that kind of stuff, it usually does. But it is a really good search feature. It works very well. Um. Daryl just clarified his uh, oh, earlier question. Wait. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry. I misinterpreted the question. Um, well, it's a judgment call because uh, what's going to happen is as you drop to those six-inch baits, you will lower your chances of catching the eye of that trophy, but you will increase your chances of the schooly fish grabbing a hold of it. Um, so it, it is a judgment call. Uh <clears throat> If you want to catch more numbers of fish, do it earlier, maybe, you know, on the 15th, as soon as the size limit drops. And if you want to, if instead you prefer to target, you know, fewer fish, but bigger, keep pulling those big baits. Cool. Uh, sorry, I'm going through here. Uh, <laughs> well, that's good. That means we got plenty of questions and I love questions. I love it when we can hear from people. How fast and deep do you use your umbrella and tandem rigs? Okay. How fast is a question we get asked all the time. <clears throat> General rule of thumb, slower is better. Two and a half, three miles an hour is plenty. You really don't need to be going faster than that. Now, of course, which way you're going uh, in relation to the current will have an effect here, right? 
uh, if you're going with the current, your boat is moving slower through the water than if you're going against the current, then it's moving faster through the water. So I tell people there are a couple ways to deal with this. The first thing is troll across the bay, east, west, right? Or zigzag along a shelf going, going east, southeast, then southwest. That way you're always kind of going across the current and the current won't have as much effect. Second thing is before you set your lines all the way back there, take a tandem rig, hold it next to the boat after you've set your speed. Just hold it right next to the boat and watch it. Are those tails wiggling enticingly? Great, keep your speed. Are they dragging? You might need to give it a little click more. Um, are they going crazy? Hyper, hyper paddle? Uh, you might want to pull back on the throttle a little bit. So, you know, that's an important item. Um, and then as far as how deep, so the whole idea here, you know, is basically to cover the water column. That's, you know, when you, when you have this massive spread of lines, you're going to be running all different areas. So you're going to have some tandems that are threes and fives, and you're going to have some that are fives and eights, right? And you're going to spread those out through your spread so that you've got some running at 10 feet and you got some running at 20 feet and you also want some running even deeper than that you want somewhere 30 35. now during trophy season the bulk of the fish that you hook are going to be in the top 20 feet of the water column um not true at other times of the year i'm talking strictly the trophies um and uh, but but there will be days when the fish for whatever reason they go deeper this is often when your boat rods come into play you can throw you know 20, 26 ounces in front of an umbrella rig and get it to go down. Um, you can throw extra weight in front of a tandem and let it go, you know, get it down. Although I got to say, most of the charter guys and the Sharpies that I see, they don't add weight to their tandems. They just use different weights for their tandem rigs, you know, different weight shad, uh, uh, you know, parachute heads for their tandem rigs, as opposed to adding weight to the rig itself. That's kind of how they do it. Uh, but then the umbrellas, you'll sometimes see a swivel clip with, you know, 20 ounces of lead in front of it. Those are generally run from your um, your boat rods. They're not set out on the planer boards. Those heavier rigs often, you know, getting the clip to stay is a pain in the butt. It just doesn't work well. So a lot of those guys, the planer boards are running up high, higher in the water column, whereas the boat rods are stacked to get really down. And what's interesting is, you know, most of the time, the planar lines are the ones that catch your fish. But on those really tough days when you just can't seem to get a bite, it's often that boat rod super deep that saves the day. Gets like the one fish of the day or the two fish of the day, you know. I, I mean, speaking historically here, when one or two fish was, you know, a really tough day. Honestly, right now, if you go out and catch two trophy rockfish in a day, you're doing good. Don't feel bad about that, you know. It, Years ago, we might have called that a tough day. Today, that's a great day. So it's just a great indication of how much the fisheries change and how easy it is to get fooled over time, right? Because, you know, there's a big difference between being psyched over two fish and being psyched over 12 fish. So uh, we got two questions from Les here. I'm going to start with the latest one he did. What's your thought of running dummy lines for the deep marks? I, you know, if you want to do it, God bless you, have fun. Um, there was a day when everybody ran dummy lines, right? And then for people who don't know, they're like, they're not even on a rod. They're attached to the boat. Uh, in the old days, they would, they would have uh, a spring and then a bell <laughs> and then, and then the line and it's super heavy stuff, like, you know, 200 pound test or something. And when the bell starts jingling, you grab the line and hand over hand it in. Um, I haven't seen folks use many of those in recent years. Um, you know, if you if you want to set them out, God bless you, go for it, right? There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but it's it's um, a different way of dragging a fish up to the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Les's other question. Hearing anything from the coast, usually when they start catching in the surf, the mess has left the bay. We are hearing a little bit from the coast. Uh, for two weeks, two weeks ago, we got the first reports of stripers in the surf. Uh, last week, we got a few. We didn't get any recently, uh, but I think that's weather related. Um, our coastal correspondent, John Uckert, is actually on the beach right now. He has been for several days. He got there, I think it was Friday or Saturday. 
Uh, and the bottom line is it's been blowing the whole time. And, the, and it was first it was blowing real hard. Then it got cold. Then it blew some more. Then the water got all stirred up. I got a text from him this morning, uh, dressed up like an Eskimo, standing on the beach trying to catch fish. <laughs> it was not the prettiest sight in the world. So uh, I'm not sure if that's maybe why we haven't gotten a bunch more. But we were getting them. We haven't getting them. Um, and, you know, the way the fish spawn is it's not like clockwork. Uh, and some years they all go at once. Some years it's a very spread out spawn. Some years it's early, some years it's late, some years it's both, you know, just spread way across it. Um, and, and I got the feeling we're looking at a really spread out spawn because, like I said earlier, uh, you're right. It's an indicator when they start popping up in the surf that they've left the bed. Um, but in, I'm telling you, more than half of the pictures I've seen in the last week, the fish have been really fat. I mean, sagging bellies, you know. Might they have just eaten three pound, you know, three bunker that were a pound each and be stuffed because of that? Well, sure they may. But when you see picture after picture like that, you, you got to start to think there's a lot of fish that haven't spawned yet. <clears throat> so I got to guess that there's a fair number of fish that still haven't spawned. Plus, let's add to that now the fact that we're getting the reports of the shad anglers hooking into them up at Fletcher's. So that tells you that some haven't spawned yet. So you got both, right? You got both things going on. It may just be a really protracted spawn. All right. We got time for just a few more questions. Bring them on. We're the best spots near the Severn. So Cole, I'll tell you what I have. So uh, historically, you know, just leaving the Severn and then as soon as you hit, you know, 25 feet, 30 feet and throwing the lines out has, has been a good move. Uh, trolling around the ships is normally a good move. I have seen multiple pictures with the ship anchorage, the ships in the background. So I'm not sure I'd go a heck of a lot farther if I was leaving out the Severn. And like I say, you know, it's a lot of the reports have been the Thomas Point zone to the Salmon zone. So I would not encourage running real far north or running real far south at the moment. You know, of course, this could change next week. But and you'll see this in the reports tomorrow, folks, when the reports come out. I have already seen some of the information, not all. I'm waiting for uh, Molly to send me more, but I've seen some of it, and this is what I'm seeing. And uh, yeah, you know, I I go out and head fish around the ships, fish over to Bloody, fish back across to Thomas, and then head back up that triangle, the ship anchorage to Bloody to Thomas, back up to the anchorage. That should be a good triangle right now, relatively speaking. You know, from what we're seeing in the reports. All right. Have you had success on the Chesapeake with large bunker spoons? Oh, my God, Sam. So that's a great question. <clears throat> so when I was a kid, we always pulled big spoons. I mean, a number 21 Tony Asetta, you know, the biggest one they make. That was like you never trolled without that being out there amongst the lures. Um, and, and one day, I don't know, maybe this was 10, 12 years ago, Long after parachutes and and uh, shad bodies became the norm, I was talking to a charter captain named Ed Darwin. Now, Ed Darwin has been around a lot longer than me. He's been around a lot longer than most of the captains on the bay. He's an incredibly intelligent man. I wouldn't I would not hesitate to rank him at the very top of the angling keep in the Chesapeake Bay. He really just knows how to fish. And I asked him this question one day. I said, Captain Ed, how come like everybody uses tandems and parachutes and umbrellas now? Nobody, nobody pulls big spoons anymore. Why not? And he said, you know what? I stopped pulling them too. And the reason is they miss too many times when the fish go after them. I thought, well, that's interesting. I never heard that before. I don't know why that is. Now, mind you, at the time, I was still pulling a number 21 Tony every time I trolled. Back then, I still trolled quite a bit. I'd have one straight down the middle all the way back with only, just like six ounces of lead on it, way, way, way back. That was my, my shotgun one. And occasionally, it would catch fish. And one day after this conversation with Captain Ed, I was trolling along, and I had that out there, and I saw that rod tip go 
boom, pop right back up. I thought, huh. All right. All right. Captain had already educated me. And evidently, I wasn't smart enough to listen. So you know what I did? I reeled that line in. I put on a tandem ring and sent it back there. So, you know, <laughs> um, yes, I've had success with them. Yes, they absolutely will work. Um, and people who are better trollers than me have advised me that I will miss fewer hits with the tandems and umbrellas. And after learning my lesson the hard way, <laughs> I no longer pull the spoon when I do troll. Now that's uh, again, again, we're, and we're just talking trophy springtime here, okay? Trophy springtime. All right, here we go. Speed round. <laughs> Speed round. Okay, what do you think about the perch this year so far? Any good spots on Herring Bay? I have not heard of any good spots on Herring Bay as of yet. Perch this year, uh, it wasn't as horrible. As it might have been, the perch are definitely not as good as they used to be. <laughs> you know, that's another fishery that I'm starting to wonder about. Uh, the yellows were particularly bad this year. The whites were less bad. Uh, had a pretty good run in the packs. Uh, the eastern shore, the weather was a little funky. Uh, the DNR was saying they may have spawned farther downriver than normal. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it definitely was a little wacky. And, yeah, I'm a little worried about the perch, too. All right, next. What about trolling near the target ship? Uh, so, dang, Milton, I'm not sure. Uh, it's not generally a zone that you hear about a lot for trophies. It's not my backyard. And I generally do my trophy fishing in the middle or upper bay. I haven't gone that far south to fish for trophies. So I honestly don't know. I got a big off. I don't know. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. Got success on the Chesapeake Alert. Oh, wait, that was the same one. <laughs> you said something about the power plant. Are you referring to Wagner's? No, I'm referring to the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant uh, down off Calvert Cliffs. Um, I apologize for not specifying, but as far as trophies go, that's generally, you know, that's that's where you're talking about finding your trophy fish while you're jigging with light tackle uh, in the off um harder parts of the season, the cooler parts of the season. Once it warms up, of course, they're not in there anymore. Um, and, you know, heck, they're in there all winter. I mean, you know, someone's going to shout at me for giving away the power plant. Just for the record, people, the power plant is not a secret. Many of us have been fishing it for generations. Uh, and like I said, I talked to a guy who was there on Monday. There were 13 boats there on a Monday morning. Uh, if you go there, you have to expect to find a crowd. OK, that's the way it is, unless it's the middle of February and 14 degrees, in which case you might have it to yourself. All right. How do you know the depth of your rigs? Like, when can I reach 25 feet? So there is an app for that. It is called the Trollmaster Depth Calculator, uh, which I am told is a very good app. I don't use it myself because I'm not. A big phone guy i'm not a big app guy and it's just a little too teched out for me but i'm told that it is highly accurate uh now that said generally speaking the the old-fashioned way this is this is how i learned depth okay you trolled with uh you know let's say your lightest rig was a three ounce and a five ounce on your tandems you trolled and trolled and trolled, and you decided to move a little shallower, and you got to 21 feet of water, and that rod tip started going chuka 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 because it was dragging bottom. That was how you knew that rig was a 20. Okay. Now you count the bars when you're level line as you're letting out these lines, so you know that had X amount of line out, and you would say, okay, I let out 15 bars. That's running too deep to troll into 20 feet of water. I'm going to crank it in five bars, or I'm going to put a lighter roars. That was kind. Of, that's like. Kind of how you knew way back when. Um, these days, Trollmaster Depth Calculator. Cool. Your opinion on the Man Stretch 25 is called my largest stripe paper on this. Was okay, so uh, I have pulled them. Uh, they're okay. I don't think they outcatch tandems, not at all. Uh, I, I, they're very popular in Virginia. A lot of the Virginia guys always troll their stretches. Uh, you see it on the coast, too. A lot of those guys troll their stretches, and they do well with them. I'm not going to knock them. 
Um, but I've had them out in a spread with the other stuff. And I can't say that they've caught more. Now, if you, you know, catch a fish in a day, it might come on that rig, but you can't really count that. You got to look at your times when you're catching, you know, 10 fish through the course of a day and then look at what lures they hit. And if, you know, eight of them hit the mans, would I go crazy on them and start putting them out like nuts? You bet. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, but that's not the kind of response I've seen. I'm going to say one other thing about the mans. Big danger with the mans or for this matter, for that matter, with the spoons or with any other lure that swims on its own. If you put that in the wrong spot in your spread and you turn too quickly, you got a monster tangle on your hands. The stretches will do that. So if somebody wants to try a stretch, I would recommend sending it way back down the middle and keeping it away from all the other lines. All right. Woo, I think I poked myself worse there. Man. And we're going we're gonna to leave it with Daryl since he's the big winner today anyway. Daryl, don't forget to uh, send us a message through uh, Facebook uh, or, you know, email if you want, the old-fashioned way, um, and you'll get your uh, get your hat. Um, and, of course, hat. Your hat, your koozies. And your koozies and your everything. Survey. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, one last time, I'm going to put up the Woo Box thing. Um, if you guys want to uh, just sign up for, for that, get an email reminder. Um, and that's about it, Lenny. We had a great crowd. Of course, we went over, but that's okay. Um, and... Uh, you know, again, big thanks to Shimano for sponsoring this. And uh, big thanks to everybody tuned in. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Chris, for stepping in when you were needed. Uh, we got to give Zach a break every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next time.